sales were increasing quite a bit, especially in California, where year over year, we had over a 25% increase in sales in California. What if the Chinese, due to margin calls at home, need to offload? Now, I'm not talking about your family in one primary residence. I'm talking about somebody with multiple properties. What's up, guys? I'm Nobody Special, and our guest today is once again, Miss Melody Wright, who is here to talk to us about the residential real estate market, about the commercial real estate market, and some of the things that are going on behind the scenes in the background of real estate finance. And she's found some very interesting stuff here. And I wanted to bring her onto the channel to talk to you guys about that. Melody, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Jack. And thank you for having me. And thank you so much for making the time to talk. I know you are busy. Um, I was watching your channel, by the way, Melody has a YouTube channel and sooner or later, it's going to be much bigger than mine um, because you are growing fast. And I think your channel is fantastic. You bring a very unique set of skills, if you will, your background knowledge, your access to certain data is really phenomenal. And on your channel, you were talking about some unusual activity that we saw in residential real estate, in particular luxury residential real estate and some of this recent data. Talk to us a little bit about what you found and then what you suspect might be going on behind the scenes. Yeah, so it's a, it's a little complicated, uh, Jack, but I'll do my best. And so, you know, one thing that I had been noticing when we looked at existing home sales uh, that NAR puts out is that a lot of what's transacting out there are the 1 million plus. Uh, so where we had increases in sales, you could see lower distribute, like decreases in sales you know, in all of those uh, kind of below 500,000 in, in sticker price, whereas the, the plus 1 million definitely were increasing. So I've been focusing on this area for some time and kind of what I saw. So shockingly, when, cause I track 80 cities every week. Uh, I use different, I use realtor.com for inventory. I use Redfin for all my sales metrics and things like that because they do a really great uh, market insights on their website that I can gather that data easily. And what I started seeing as I was going through my updates for February is sales were increasing, you know, quite a bit from the previous month. Um, and, and it made me very curious, especially in California where, uh, so we got existing home sales out there today. Now they use seasonally adjusted numbers that came out at about, you know, 9% increase month over month, but they said not really year over year. But I can tell you for the cities that I track, I track 15 cities in California that year over year, we had over a 25% increase uh, in sales in California. And, you know, I would say that my markets are probably skewed to the more uh, upper income, the, the luxury, because I always found those markets very interesting in California. Um, and and you didn't see the same increase in sales in like Los Angeles, for instance. Uh, it really these double digits were in these higher areas like Newport Beach, places like that. Um, so increase in sales made me curious in the luxury in California. At the same, so I've been thinking a lot about this, and uh, you know, initially I kind of thought it was Nvidia, Nvidia mania. You know, you and I have been following them closely. This is a mania and we know it. And I felt, okay, people in California, they were feeling really awful last year with all the layoffs. You know, it was just, it was, it was abysmal out there, especially in California, especially in San Fran. We know think people are moving back to San Fran now. We know people are feeling pretty awesome about that Nvidia stock. And, and so I thought, okay, that's part of the reason. But then I started, I, I just noticed a Gucci store, a story on Gucci talking about, you know, the Chinese, um, basically that lackluster demand impacting Gucci results. Now I follow in my macro work, I don't talk about it as much on my channel, but I follow China very closely <laughs> because what happens in China is going to impact us. And, you know, they've had their own property crisis, as you're well aware through Evergrande, you know, those types of things. So, um, you know, I, I started to think about, OK, what if, um, you know, sort of and it, it is a complicated story. But what if, you know, the Chinese due to either, you know, margin calls at home because maybe they live here, but they have family there or businesses there and things are getting pretty dire, need to offload. Now, I'm not talking about your guy 
uh, or your family in one primary residence. I'm talking about somebody with multiple properties. And so maybe they have a margin call. Maybe their family is suffering back home. They need to offload an asset. The other scenario could also be if it is a state actor, um, we know China owns Apple, you know, real estate is 85% of global wealth. Everybody's playing. Everybody's playing. So it could be state actors as well saying, you know what, we're we're bringing everything back in. I mean, this is something we've been hearing about China and it's time to liquidate and bring that cash back home. You know, doesn't make a lot of sense. People wouldn't want to do that. But if if the state tells you to do it in the Communist Party under G, you're going to do it or you might find yourself falling out a window or something like that. You know, so you know, I think that could be part of it. And it, and honestly, I think it could also be the super rich that saw what happened with Russian assets going, hey, you know what? Yeah, of course, the dollar is king. Of course, I want these in dollars, but I may need to extract it from the real estate market and hide it elsewhere so that my, you know, house doesn't get uh, seized or you know, think yachts that were seized, things like that. And so I think it's a probably very complicated um, set of drivers, but I do believe that this might be impacting sales in California. And I had kind of a little confirmation when talking about this out on X Twitter, I was talking to a colleague who um, is very much in commercial real estate, but also has friends all over the real estate markets and in Orlando, Florida, which is the highest uh, foreign ownership for real estate, 23% per CNBC, was saying that the only people calling him to list were the Chinese. And so this is one story. Uh, and and I, ha I this is all speculation because I, I can't prove it until I start doing the deep dive research. But I will be doing that over the next couple of weeks to find out, is this, could this be part of it? Because it was a... I. Even the mania, I understood we were going to see higher sales in California with people returning back to San Fran was going to see that that market kind of heating up. But this these increases, there seems something very um, uh, intentional about it, I guess. And also the fact that I, I don't know why I'm the only one that is talking about it right now, which also makes me more curious and sorry that was a lot of words jack so no don't don't apologize there was a lot to unpack there um i suspect one of the reasons why you might be the only one talking about it is maybe you're one of the few people who sees it because the visibility of this data you had mentioned when we were talking earlier it's not readily apparent that this is going on because of some of the differences between mls and other records so could you talk a little bit about sure. maybe why you think you're the only one talking yeah. about this yeah. So, you know, the housing market and following it is so complicated because there's so many vested parties who have their own cut of the data and you can never tie them back. And and so I think one of the reasons, so the National Association of Realtors, they're the ones that control existing home prices, existing home sales when that data gets released. Now, how do they get that information? They use the multiple listing services, our sites. They and you know they have the most out of everybody. They aggregate up all those MLSs where people are entering in details about these sales, um, and that's how they get their information. Redfin is very unique in the way that they they use MLS. They don't have near the access that the NAR does, National Association of Realtors. But they do use some MLS because there's over 600 of these sites out there. You have different aggregators that you can buy them, like the top 50 markets or whatever. NAR, of course, has access to all of them. <laughs> Redfin does not. But what they did to augment the data to make it better is they started it, it, including county records. So when whenever a transaction occurs uh, that's a legit transaction, <laughs> and there's ones that aren't, um, a, a deed gets recorded at the county showing that transfer of ownership. And so Redfin goes out and pulls that county information. Now, there's over 3,000 counties in this country. Some of them are still using pencils and fax machines. So they're not getting those counties. They're getting the counties with like the electronic records. Um, and, and just a quick side note, one reason they often too have weirder results is that those counties typically have a delay for recording those documents. 
So you can actually go on Redfin and you'll see the numbers change throughout the month as they get more information in. And so this is the difference. NAR doesn't have just those county records. Well, you know, there's a lot of transactions that happen outside the MLS, the for sale by others, what we call pocket listings. And then we've also, from the private note sales, the investor bros are doing some tricky things like looking like a home is sold to someone else, but there's no cash transaction and keeping those prices looking higher, you know, because really you can say in your deed for the sum of $10, <laughs> I'm like, you know, registering this sale. And so data is very complicated and confusing. And one of the reasons why when I use Redfin, I'm getting a combination of both that MLS and this other data. And I can tell you that the Redfin, I sort of did a historical correlation to NAR. Um, and I'm about, you know, 4% higher than them on both year over year and month over month uh, for home sales. Now, the difference as well, too, though, is existing home sales uh, only tracks existing homes, not new sales. And Redfin also tracks those. So I know that was a ton of information. <laughs> but the point is that, you know, you can't take one of these series and have it stand for the housing market. They are all using limited cuts of information that they have access to. No one has all the information. And so anyone to be the authority, be it Altos, NAR, that's just not possible, you know? And so kind of what I try to do is bring as much of those data points together to triangulate and see a more comprehensive view. And so what I'm seeing is a combination of what's on county records and what's on the MLS plus, you know, NAR in this release is not talking about those new home sales either. So we're seeing a surge in homes, notably in luxury markets in California, but it's not showing up in the NAR data because NAR relies on MLS. These are all sales that are taking place off MLS. So it's not your traditional go to a realtor, list it on the open market and see who comes in. These are taking place some other way, either, you know, organized behind the scenes or without realtors involved. But this big spike in luxury homes in California markets is happening off of MLS. And so because you use predominantly Redfin data, which incorporates those county records, you see it, but maybe a, a Zillow or the National Association of Realtors, they don't see it. So that's you know, right. It's probably why you're one of the few people talking about it is because you're one of the few people who can actually see it. And a lot of the other people who can see it maybe have different agendas, whereas you're just crunching the raw data. You don't have a horse in this right. race. So you're right. you're calling it like you see it. Right. Now, your theory about it could potentially be Chinese investors, maybe a reversal of the capital flight out of China is interesting because we do have some data now that says things in China are even worse than they've been saying. And, you know, I've been saying things in China are worse than they've been saying since 2021 when the mm -hmm. Evergrande story first started. You've got that data point about Gucci showing just a collapse of the luxury consumer in China right now. And, you know, that's kind of an outlier too, because here in the States, we're seeing luxury brands are actually doing okay because of the, the wealth gap exploding here. Like Abercrombie and Fitch had fantastic results in their most recent quarter because the upscale shopper is not being squeezed by inflation, like maybe the people who shop at Kohl's, who's seeing big, you know, mm -hmm. declines in same store sales. Um, right. I'm going to throw a chart up on the screen here for a second. Um, this is showing major accounting scandals. We had this story in Bloomberg recently that China Evergrande Group had overinflated their sales for 2019 and 2020 by 78 billion dollars. And you know, I I know we live in the era of trillions here. Uh, but $78 billion would make it the largest accounting scandal in history. I and mean, there's some comparable numbers up there. Enron, you know, which is like. I, I know looking at Enron just blows my mind. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Look at, look at little Enron there. Little like, Enron. Really little little Enron. Yeah. yeah. Enron is like the Pluto in this conversation to, to Evergrande's Jupiter. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Luck and Coffee was a big one. WorldCom just dwarfed. I mean, there's not even room on the screen to show the whole circle yes. for how big the accounting fraud at Evergrande was. So, and we already knew things were bad at Evergrande and now it turns out things are even worse. And as you know, when when someone gets margin called, they don't sell what they want to sell. They sell whatever they can sell. 
Uh, and so if you were a wealthy, maybe Communist Party connected individual who had been able to get some of your money out of the country because they let you, well, you're not going to sell your country garden bonds. You're not going to sell your Vanka <laughs> group bonds, right? Because you can't get five cents on right. the dollar for those. So maybe you're going to sell your U.S. real estate holdings. And right. we know wealthy Chinese investors have been buying a lot of real estate in the U.S. in markets like Florida and California, mm -hmm. as you mentioned. And so maybe that's an explanation for why we're seeing these these this big spike in real estate transactions in these markets. So that, that was yeah. a really interesting story. And you're the only one who caught it. I haven't heard anything about a spike in luxury home sales in California anywhere else. And, uh, you know, it, it just, it speaks to, you know, the way you parse the data and what you're looking at and the access that you have. It's one of the reasons why I say your channel is going to be bigger than all of ours pretty soon. Uh, something you. else that you talked about, you know, I had our friends Travis and Todd on the channel over the weekend, and we were talking about the NAR settlement. And it, it was kind of funny to watch those two go back and forth about loan officers. That was, that was fun to referee that one. Uh, now, both of them were focused on the commissions and the effect of what's going to happen to the way we transact in real estate moving forward. But you have a, a pretty interesting theory about the NAR settlement also that didn't have as much to do with the commissions. That was really just a cover story that really this is a fight over real estate data. And that's another very unique perspective that you have. I haven't heard that anywhere. But if you look at some of the big reactions in the stock market that happened after the NAR settlement, like Zillow really took a hit. Uh, Compass really took a hit. These are these are firms that deal in real estate data, aren't they? So talk to us a little bit about what you think is going on there. Yeah, so it's, you know, one of, um, as I got out of operations and mortgage finance, I went into fintech and started building technology um, for the industry and, you know, saw over time and time again, I would be part of building a better product and either we would get maneuvered out or bought and retired <laughs> uh, because, you know, there, th the mortgage industry, the real estate industry, the title industry, these are, think of them like old family money. I mean, these are, they're, they're mobs. Uh, they, they, you know, very, very addicted to uh, the money and wealth they've gotten from this industry. And because there's really no other reason why they wouldn't have made changes. And so, you know, fintech, big tech tried to come in. They kind of failed at every turn because it is such a complicated market. Um, and also there was just not a lot of cooperation from the industry. And so I believe that, yes, kind of this cover story is about commissions. But at the end of the day, this is more about how we transact, how people can sell you uh, a home, uh, you know, everything we do online, we're all cloud surfs, uh, you know, essentially we, we manufacture information for other people to take from us and make money off of it. <laughs> and so, you know, in essence, this is the biggest purchase most of us are going to make in our lifetime. People want in on that game and, the, and they really haven't been allowed in. Until recently, when ICE, who owns a New York Stock Exchange, also bought the largest origination system and then merged with the largest servicing system. And so that data is, is so rich. The only other set of data that's near this is healthcare, uh, healthcare data. Um, but mortgage data is going to talk about every single transaction. Every They're going to know more about you than anybody else except for healthcare. And a lot of times in healthcare, I think we all lie to doctors for exactly this reason. <laughs> if you know what I mean, we don't want them to know everything. In mortgage, you know just about everything. And so I think that this is more about when you look at the plaintiffs in the case that, and you look at, you know, this is more about the long term for that data and who owns it who accesses it, who can control it. And, and, you know, to me, NAR is the biggest lobbying firm. A $415 million slap on the wrist is nothing. And it reminds me so much of my uh, AG settlement, our DOJ settlement in mortgage, you know, where my ultimate and my federal consent orders and those amounts, which, you know, had absolutely nothing to do with the true harm that had happened in the industry, but it was a way to kind of perform, 
penitence, if you know what I mean. And I think that that's, I think that there were probably some backroom deals where this slap on the wrist, you know, if they got some sort of concession as well as to kind of go out there and have this feel good story about how the DOJ wrangled those nasty, you know, NAR folks for trying to double charge or whatever. I'm just, I'm making it very simple here. Um, but in reality, NAR is still the largest lobbying group in DC. And so I think that as is the case with most things right now, it's a bunch of narrative and performance that in reality, it's going to be kind of a bloody fight between big tech and the old guard. But I guarantee you there's already defectors from the old guard that are working. They're going to figure out how to get paid at the end of it. And, and the winners will not be the consumers. And, and I think that that's, that's where I think most have gotten this wrong because they're looking at the details that are right in front of them versus what does this mean really long term for the industry? Because they want us to transact the way that we transact out of a vending machine. You know, although Carvona had its issues, <laughs> I'm pretty sure none of us will be using a realtor in the future um, to, to buy a home. I mean, that is if, you know, we're not just given one. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> and what I mean by like, you are in block A, cell two <laughs> from our command and control government. <laughs> but yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. No matter what really comes out of this, ultimately, it's the consumer that loses every time. Uh, sad state of affairs, but such is the world we live in. Now, you sent me another recent article. Let's shift gears a little bit to the commercial <laughs> side of real estate. Because you sent me this one from Bloomberg a few, uh, this was a few weeks ago, the story's a week or two old, and apparently this happened back in January, we're just hearing about it now. A missing $164 million highlights new risk for mortgage bonds. Let me just give folks the background here, and then you can talk a little bit about what's going on here. We had this uh, mortgage bond went into default, a story we've all heard a lot about. Uh, they defaulted at the end of 2022. This was uh, $675 million worth of loans that were backed by 60 apartment buildings. So, you know, thousands of apartments potentially involved here. And I guess they finally sold the loans. Um, they managed to get $513 million for the loan. So they're taking a big loss on this deal. And now it's coming down to who gets what of the scraps from this sale. And along comes the special servicer who, you know, the special servicer takes over for the loan when the payments stop getting made. And it's their job to get as much value for the bondholders as possible. And they announced that they are going to do a holdback of $164 million. They're just basically telling the bondholders, you can't have this $164 million yet. We're hanging on to that. So what is going on? Why would Midland not give these people their money. They've already taken a bath on the sale and now they have to wait. What is going on with that story? Yeah. So I think, you know, us talking about it just offline as well, sort of further consolidated my thoughts. But, you know, I think that anybody that's been a part of something like this, where you have these tranches of interest, understand that this becomes a bloody, uh, again, another bloody fight, like just a between the bondholders, um, who gets what, and in many cases, whoever's going to be the trustee of that fight, uh, be it the special service or an actual bankruptcy trustee, like there's going to be a lot of cost involved. Um, you know, my company, ResCap, filed bankruptcy in 2013. There is still an existing trust. There are still arguments and fights between bondholders of that debt from all those years ago. And so I think that's probably the special servicer, which, by the way, is affiliated with PNC. Um, you know, realize that they're going to need to hold back some money for these uh, expenses for this potential fight, even though they won't tell us anything specifically. But what I would mention here is that for anybody who hasn't been a part of one of these fights, you don't understand that there's 20 pages of covenants in your contract. A covenant's basically like, if this happens, then you have to do X, Y, Z. Most people never even read those. They don't, even the lawyers, it's kind of like the, you know, uh, big short quote, even the lawyers don't look at them, right? Until all of a sudden you're like, holy mother and goodbye to $164 million overnight. And so I, I just think that we've come to a point in, in 
with, I think, kind of younger folks maybe being a part of these deals that haven't been through this, where they don't understand that when all of this goes, you know, out the window, all kinds of things start happening that you never thought would happen. And all of a sudden, there's no liquidity anywhere, you know, and it's the always we know who's been swimming naked because these contracts, nobody can understand. And so it's going to take a team of lawyers. And that's why the lawyers always get rich in this part of the cycle. <laughs> so. so if I could grossly oversimplify this, um, a lot of money was lost on this deal. And you've got all these various classes of bondholders that all have different rights and privileges. And then there's pages upon pages of paragraphs that say, if this happened, this guy gets X, this guy gets Y. But if that happens, this guy gets H and he gets J and this and that. And then now we're at the point where the lawyers for all the different classes of bondholders are going to say, aha, paragraph one says this. And the other lawyer says, no, paragraph three says that I get, you get, he gets, well, he said, mm -hmm. and Midland is saying, you know what, until you guys sort that out amongst yourselves, we're going to hang on to this 164 million. You guys figure out who's going to get what, and then come tell us. Am, am I understanding this correctly that this is what's happening here? I, we think so. They won't tell us explicitly, but that is definitely what's inferred. Okay. But so now, regardless, yeah. your money, when all when you are part of these types of deals, it's never as safe as you think it is. Yeah. So that's interesting, especially in the context of the bankruptcy of your former company. You know, that was 2013, I think you said, and it's mm -hmm. still being fought over 11 years later. So mm -hmm. what this means is when these big losses happen on these buildings, it's happening all over the country, that money isn't freed up. From the sale of the loan that money is getting frozen in place mm -hmm. so the the notable thing about this story was the size of the holdback 164 million so this if this becomes a common thing could even further stress liquidity in the commercial real estate market at a time where they're desperate for it and again the only one who wins is the lawyers uh so you know, not that there's any shortage of bad news in commercial real estate but this certainly can't be good news for the cre market can it no, and I think people grossly underestimate what is needed when these things start defaulting and imploding. And they think, you know, provision of XYZ is enough, even though we saw the article come out saying the banks aren't provisioned adequately. But when this stuff starts blowing up, there's never enough money because it is about the person next to you who thought that you could margin call and you turn around to them and they're not there anymore because they've been, you know, from their own margin call. <laughs> and so it just becomes a domino effect. And there is not enough provision for the commercial real estate market. Plus on top, we know that everybody thinks they're going to get bailed, a bailed out anyway, and they have the upper hand. Um, so uh, yep, yeah, agree. <laughs> well, even if, it, if, the, even if it does come to bailouts, right, the banks got bailed out in the GFC and yet they're still fighting over the scraps of some of those deals. Absolutely. So, you know, Absolutely. For the holders. Yep. And you know, Folks, this is the kind of stuff that you get on Melody's Substack and her YouTube channel and her Twitter feed. These stories that are kind of going on behind the scenes. It's it's kind of like third, fourth page news because it's not a big deal yet, but she catches this stuff before it becomes a big deal. And then when it is a big deal, you're not caught off guard about it. Uh, and that's why I think your channel is so unique and your Substack is so good. And that's why I'm going to put links to all that stuff down below. And I highly recommend you guys check out all that stuff. Melody, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Is there uh, any, I'll give you the last word here, anything you want to throw in at the end? Um, more stories that maybe are going on that we are not privy to? I just want to give a shout out to you, Jack. I mean, what you're doing is so courageous and amazing. And the stories you're talking about me, uh, -uh like the stories you're bringing to the forefront are so critical. And, you know, they're the stories that can save lives, Jack. I mean, you know, we know what happened in history during the Great Depression. We've also seen what's been happening in our country with deaths of despair. But, you know, I, I'm hearing every single day about people putting all their money in, in, in NVIDIA, for instance. And so to me, I just want to say thank you for the public service that I think you're doing. It is so appreciated. And I'm just honored to know you, honestly. Well, thank you. I appreciate that very much. Uh Look, wrong until proven right when it comes to NVIDIA. Um, I, I've been I've been crying foul about that company since 500 bucks. It's over 900. I mean, we've been talking for about 
30 minutes here. It could be a thousand by now for all I right. know. Um, right. It's the most crowded trade in history. And you know what? The, when you're riding a wave, it feels great. And right up until it doesn't. Exactly. And uh, I, I appreciate the concern. And uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And thank you for your time once again. Guys, that's Melody Wright. Links down below to her Substack, her YouTube, and her Twitter feed. You should be following every single one of those. And until next time, everybody, live small and dream big.